entire life. And I went to, to UCLA and I studied fine arts um, and art history. And then um, when I was getting ready to graduate, I figured out that I was completely unemployable. And so I changed my major quickly to economics, got a degree in econ, and then I still didn't know what I wanted to do, so I went to business school and I went to Penn to Wharton. I was a little bit of a uh, uh, fish out of water because I was uh, you know, missing my class and one of the two people that came directly from undergraduate without business experience. So there I was kind of in the shark tank with the management consultants and uh, the investment bankers and then, you know, this young kid from California. So I graduated from, from Penn and I still didn't know what I wanted to do, so I, I did what people who don't know what they want to do, do, and that is going to management consulting. So I spent uh, 12 years of, uh, at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, I was a partner there. I ran the retail and distribution industry practice in the Americas, and I started doing a lot of uh, digital transformation consulting before the commercial internet. So in the late, I'm aging myself, but in the late 80s and early 90s. And I learned a lot about uh, how companies can embrace the digital world. I stayed there until 1999, and then I joined Idea Lab, which was one of the earliest internet incubators. Um, my timing was a bit off because I joined and had a magnificent time, except the stock market crashed, new companies weren't being funded, and Bill Gross, the founder, said, you can stay forever because we love you, but there's not going to be anything to do for three years because we're in this terrible polar winter. So I left there and joined um, a big web development company called Organic. I don't know if anyone's heard of it, but for Scient, Lion, Razorfish, um, and Organic was one of those publicly traded. And just as I joined the, uh, and I knew this, but the revenues were on this massive decline because the stock market had corrected. We were in the middle of the dot com bust. So we took the company private with private equity money. I let a thousand people go, which is a terrible, horrible, gut-wrenching experience. And we turned the company around and built it into um, a leading digital agency. And we did um, uh, work that you would, anything you would have seen online for Bank of America, we did your agency, Record for Dodge, Chief Chrysler, Bank of America, and uh, we were also at one time the market share leader in e-commerce builds. So, um, while I was there, um, uh, my number two guy, who was absolutely fantastic, said, I've been here for 12 years, I'm bored, I need to get out of there, I need to find something else to do. So I introduced him to a, a great friend of mine, Howard Morgan, who's a venture capitalist with First Round Capital, which is a big um, early stage investor um, in New York and in the Valley. And Howard had been on my board, I worked for him at Idea Lab, and so Howard, uh, found a startup for Troy. And the startup was called Video Egg. And so I wrote my first check as an angel investor and I joined the board. Which year was it? This was 2005 or six. And I joined the board and I've been on the, I've been on the board since until uh, actually last month. Uh, so that, that gave me my start in angel investing. And then I went on from there. After uh, I got completely bored at Organic, I left and took kind of a, a hard left turn and ran a virtual world called Second Life for two years. How many of you know Second Life, have been in Second Life? Yeah, well that was a wild experience. Yes. Maybe Anyways. time for another talk. Um, it would not be a PG, it would probably be R-rated because of Second Life. <laughs> Uh, and then after Second Life, um, uh, I stayed there for two years and then I, I, I stopped and I started focusing solely on my angel investment. And that brings me pretty much up to today. Great. Well, uh, I want to talk with you about a couple of things. I want to talk with you about your corporate experience. Sure. I want to talk with you about your angel investor experience. Um, to give you a little bit of framework, I'm, I'm also an entrepreneur, an angel investor. I started three companies from scratch to exit, and I invested around 30 companies early stage. And I did a couple of company building models, which is we're going to also talk about that. And I was talking with, with Mark and sharing um, horror and love stories about what we do. And hopefully, we can talk about both because it's very easy to hear investors or entrepreneurs telling you the beautiful stuff. And you know, I had this amazing exit with amazing multiples, but I also want to talk about failure because unfortunately, what we do in early stage 
we fail a lot, and hopefully if we learn about that, we can help people to take the shortcut. And I think that's an interesting part of these conversations is about that. You were telling me a couple of amazing stories about good stuff and bad stuff. Do you want to share that a little bit? Sure. Well, I guess um, in, uh, one of the things uh, Mark and I were talking about is that there's no magic formula. Yeah. Everyone's like, what is the magic formula to early stage investing? Well, you know, the good news and the bad news is there's no magic formula. Can you come up with something that's repeatable? I hope so, but there's a lot of serendipity. So that's kind of the first and probably most important message. But in terms of horror stories, I think the, you know, the worst thing that can happen is that um, you take a, a bunch of money from a bunch of different people, which I've done, and then you turn around and you lose it. And that's really awful. It's terrible when you lose your own money. It's really awful when, when someone has put their trust in you and you lose their money. Yeah. And, you know, I've certainly experienced that. Um, but, you know, the odd thing about that, this is one particular company that, that, that I won't mention by name, but we went through that experience, raised money, mm -hmm. made a valiant effort, failed. Uh, but in the context of, uh, of that piece of work, I found two other investments that were in this same related category. Uh, that I invested in that I think will be billion dollar companies. Mm -hmm. And that would not have happened if I hadn't invested in this company that actually lost me a lot of money. So if you ask me would I like more horror in my portfolio, if it's horror like that, mm -hmm. I would take that. Yeah. Because good can come out of it. But one of the things that I really like to discuss is this whole idea about what is really important. Is the idea or is the entrepreneur and the team. When you invest, which is your investment criteria, which are really important things that you consider before signing that check? Okay. Well, I'm a management consultant by training. I mean, it's just like I'm a recovering management consultant. So I'm used to doing a lot of in-depth analysis on you know pretty much any decision that I make. It's just that at my age, I don't have to do the analysis because it kind of just automatically, I compute it automatically in my head. Uh, right, no, I don't have to do a PowerPoint presentation, it's just a mentally click through in the analysis. So, so when I look at an opportunity, the most important thing for me is that I've got to, I've got to see it with my left brain on the analytical side. No, right brain is the analytical side. I can never remember. My analytical side has to see it, but really, I have to feel it in my gut. I have to feel really, really good about it. I have to love the product. I have to see its potential. I have to see that it's an incredible user experience. Um, I, have to, I have to feel really, really good about it um, as a user, as a potential consumer of the product. I have to think the entrepreneur is fantastic. Uh, uh, and, and it doesn't just have to be a team that might be a single entrepreneur, but I have to feel that that entrepreneur is fantastic, has a savvy sense of the product, can bring people together, and can get it people, customers, excited about the product. And then the last thing is, I have to feel like it's a really big market. I have to be able to convince myself yep. that, uh, you know, whether or not it's there, that it can be a really, really big opportunity. Because the initial idea that you fall in love with is probably not going to be the idea. It's going to change. It's that going to change. It changes, you know, not once, not twice, maybe. But I've got to feel, there's got to be a spark, right? Mm -hmm. I, I really like your story with your Twitter investment. Okay. Can you share that? Sure. So, uh, Twitter, I was an early investor in Twitter. And basically what happened was I was running this digital agency called Organic. And I was always trying to bring innovation to our clients. And I was in, you know, Silicon Valley. So innovation comes from startups. So Twitter had just launched. Jeep was a big client of ours. And I thought, Wow, it would be really cool. This is remind remember this is like 2006, so this was a big idea at the time. Now you roll your eyes, but I thought, wow, all these people go off road in their jeeps. Wouldn't it be amazing if they could do a text update, SMS, to to their friends and say, I'm at Rock Four, stuck, come help, or I'm only gonna ride for another hour. Let's meet for a beer. The only way you can do that is on mobile device, right? I'm not gonna, you know, find a computer connect, internet connection, whatever. So I thought that would be a great idea. So I called the guys at Twitter and I said, hey, I have this really big budget from this really famous company. I'd like to write you a check so that you could do this thing for me. 
And you know, they thought about it, we talked about it, we talked about it, they were really good about spending time with me. This is just after they launched. And they finally came back and they said, you know what, Mark? The product doesn't really work, we just launched. If we do this thing for you, we're not gonna be able to build something that actually works. So they obviously didn't build anything for me um, for my cheap project, but I, I stayed in touch and after a while I called them back. I said, you know, I really love what you're doing. Do you need some money? Can I write a check? And they were like, yeah, sure. So I did. Uh, that, and that's, that's great because it was a product idea, it was a people idea, but you 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 thought about that as a user. And, and, I did. And that's where everything makes sense. That's and that is you you hit on the core thing. I always look at it. I mean I ran a user experience environment basically for eight years, which is what organic was, and so I I'm obsessed by user experience. But let's talk a little bit about different early stage business models. I think that many of you as entrepreneurs, you're probably familiar with all the different formulas to launch your company. And we talked in the past about incubators, accelerators, uh, classic seed rounds, company building. But let's go one by one and probably we, did, we try everything. And we know the good yes. and the of yes. those things. Um, Let's start with company building. Okay. Um, company building is basically a combination between serial previous entrepreneurs, old guys probably like us, or even older, mm -hmm. uh, which did this before, and they basically put some money and time and coaching, and they bring an entrepreneur on board with a different sort of equity. It's usually significantly lower than the classic you know, incubator. But they put money, they put coaching, they put validation, and they launch that. A uh, couple of examples trying to do similar ventures um, in Miami, all over the US, Europe, and Latin America. Um, sure, mm -hmm. you, you did that in the past, I did that. Let's, let's talk about that and, sure. and our own experiences about that. Well, that wouldn't be one of my uh, uh, best successes. But, so, so, but it, hopefully, we're going to learn from that. So, I, I went through a company building experience again, you know, no names to protect the innocent, but uh, I, I, I wrote my biggest check and probably spent my biggest effort, uh, went out and raised money on my, on my reputation, such as it is. And uh, you know we got the product to market and we failed. And uh, I figured then that I'm a better picker than I am a builder. Now, I don't know how many of you did you participated on the sign conference last week. Anyone? Okay. Uh, we saw a couple of company building great experiences as well, which means I I think that. The, the lesson learned around company building is that nobody knows the secret recipe for success, even if you have previous successes around that. It's like getting married. So just date a little bit. <laughs> and don't Google worry about it. Okay, it's just because it's a willing marriage partner doesn't mean it's a marriage that's going to work. And the, the, what you don't want it is an investor for whom that money is really, really, really important. And the reason I say that is because the, if, if, if they have the wrong mindset, which is this is a highly speculative investment, I'm going to put the money in, and I'm going to bet on the entrepreneur, then you're going to have a very, very unhappy marriage. Because they're going to be you know, in your business every day, questioning every decision. And that's, not, that's the investor I try not to be. So I write a check. I try to be as helpful as I can to the entrepreneur. Sure, I challenge them sometimes. But I have kind of a no asshole policy, and I, and, you know, if, if I ever am, please, Jordan, please call me out if I ever am. Jordan's one of the founded Skepti and it was cool. We'll talk with you later about that. Yeah, my first investment in Miami. So, so be really careful who, who you take money from. It should be somebody who has some experience writing uh, early stage checks, and I would also do kind of just a, a test with them. I'd ask them, you know. How do they behave? What do they do? And if there are references to check, I would check it. And you're all probably thinking, rolling your eyes and thinking, you know what, we're desperate for money. We're going to take whatever money we can. You know what? Um, build a great product and you won't be desperate. Um, and you'll have your pick of, uh, of investors. Incubators, that's the accelerators. Did you co-invest with any of those? Which are your thoughts? OK, so the, geez. So I have strong thoughts on that. Uh, so I really like the model because I worked at Idea Lab. So I see value in it. It was early, I love my time there. I think it's really good. 
One of the things that sometimes makes me uncomfortable about the accelerators is I feel like they're, com you know, this is a terrible generalization. Great companies come out of there, but personally, sometimes what I feel is they're, you know, they're being manufactured for investment. Um, uh, they're being manufactured for the pitch. It feels sometimes a little artificial for me. I'm a little bit more organic, if you will. I kind of like to see the company in its natural state. But that's a very personal view, and a lot of great companies come out of accelerators. Great. Um, Miami. Yes. You're a new guy in Miami. April. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I'm around for 12 years. Um, and the change that I saw in Miami during the last three or four years around the startup community is unbelievable for me. And I believe that this is going to continue, and the more success stories that we see, this is going to be better and better. The combination between places like this and uh, or the Angel Network, great events like Emerge or Sign or whatever, it's really generating a lot of good stuff. But I think that we're still early stage and far from from perfect. Um, you were saying before that it's easy to raise seed money in Miami. Let's do a quick survey. How many of you guys are raising money? How many of you did you raise money before in Miami? How many of you think it's easy to raise money in Miami? <laughs> right, well I'm an investor, you're an entrepreneur, so of course you're going to say that. Now, let's go into that, because I keep hearing all the time entrepreneurs complaining about how difficult it's raising money in Miami, and sometimes I get a little bit pissed off with that. Uh, because I think that raising money is different, is, is, is really difficult all over the world. And coming from Latin America, from Argentina, and we have a couple of Argentinians here, it's not the easiest place on earth to do business. Uh, but the good entrepreneurs are validating their story and raising money in every single place. And I think that Miami is the exception to that. But you're coming from New York and the Valley. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the differences that you see in Miami in, in comparison with those places. Well, first of all, this is a small town. I mean, uh, super, uh, super small, <laughs> which is which is actually wonderful. So I think that makes it very easy for an entrepreneur to network their way around the market pretty effectively. So I think that's a strong positive. It's also a very nurturing and supportive market. I mean, it, and events like this, I, I mean, people have been incredibly welcoming to me uh, from the time that I arrived, introducing me, uh, helping me, you know, paving the way. It's a very supportive community. So I think it's great for entrepreneurs in that sense. From a fundraising perspective, the reason I say that I think it's easy, I don't mean that it's easy, what I mean is it's no more difficult and potentially a little easier than other places. And the reason I say that is because there, I have met many, many angel investors that are writing checks in this market and I see it at AGP. And I see lots of companies come in front of, you know, the AGP folks and they walk away with checks, and not small checks. Uh, very, very impressive checks. And so I think if you build something that's great, um, and uh, uh, you network like crazy, I think you can raise money here, and uh, you can raise money from other proceeds as well. I don't think the challenge for this market is seed money. I think it's which, which Series A. Is? It's Series A. Okay. I mean, the, the, the challenge, you're gonna, I think seed funding, See, Series A is difficult everywhere. Yeah. It's very difficult. You have, and and I will tell you that the threshold keeps going higher and yeah. higher. Three years ago, when I, four years ago, when I started doing e-commerce investments, if you had fifty thousand dollars a month in revenue run rate, you could get a Series A. Yeah. Then it went to hundred thousand. Oh, I won't touch it unless there's a hundred thousand a month. Now it's two or two fifty yeah. a month. Plus great unit economics. A more competitive valuation as well. That's right. So so the bar gets raised all the time. Now, uh, so it's never easy anywhere to, 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 to raise money, but I think the A round is particularly difficult. <laughs> and it's particularly difficult here, in my opinion, because how many VC firms that do Series A investments are there? My Zero. Yeah. Uh, there, are a couple of there are a couple that are just getting themselves started. Yeah. So it's a limited set, yeah. right? So I think for Series A, like, you, know, and, you know, you talk to anyone who's been here who's raised one, you're, you're going to end up raising from other yeah. places. Uh, let's open the conversation. Uh, first of all, most of the room is entrepreneurs, which I think is fantastic. 
Um, and you know, those are the, the best people to, to talk to, most exciting, because it's a world of possibilities out there, and uh, you guys are living your dream. Nightmare at times, but your dream. So you know, it's great to see entrepreneurs in the audience, and I think this is a great, great place to start a company. You know, one of the things Mark and I were talking about is one of the things we hear from entrepreneurs is it's really hard, it's really hard to hire people. I just want to tell you something. Go to San Francisco and try to hire an engineer. <laughs> just go, go do it, and try to compete with Facebook and Twitter and Uber and everybody else that's offering these private chefs. And, you know. <laughs> dry clean drop off and stock option plans and restricted stock plans and mind boggling salaries. You'll be happy to be in Miami. My first job, I spent 12 years in that job. Um, my, my second job, I spent a year because, you know, the stock market crash. My next job, which was organic, I was there for eight years. I made sure that I was, I was done at year five and I stayed, you know, through year eight. So I think the thing is, is don't give up. Don't give up early. One of the things I hear entrepreneurs say is, oh, it's not working, I'm just gonna pivot. <laughs> well, I'm just here to tell you. Pivots are extremely expensive because it means that you're writing off everything that you've done so far. And I say economics, I understand the idea of a sunk cost. Right? I can put it behind me. But if it's every two weeks, it's a new pivot because the idea's not working. You know what? It's really hard. Don't give up quickly. You know, um, my dad always said, winners don't quit and quitters don't win. I mean, I hated him, you know, for 16 years because that like reverberated through my head. But it's true, you know, uh, quitters don't win. So it, pivot if you have to, but I think it's a much sounder strategy to evolve as opposed to pivot. Iterate and evolve. The other thing I, I would say to complement this is, uh, we see all the time problems between founders and founders walking away pretty early. And sometimes when I was running my own business, I had this vision that it's my business, it's my equity, it's fully vested since, since day one because I'm going to stay forever, 12 years, 15 years or whatever. And the three ventures that I did, I did it with that investment criteria and I never raised VC money, I always raised angel money and I skipped up to the case. Now, as an investor, I see the world from a different you know, perspective. I used to joke that for me, always, the entrepreneur was Luke Skywalker and the investor was Darth Vader for you Star Wars fans. Uh, and now, I, I don't see myself as Darth Vader, but of course not. Not. Of course not. <laughs> but I see, I can understand the fear and concerns on both sides. I believe that it's very healthy to have some sort of founders agreement, repurchase agreement, or something that commits the founders to be there and to really deliver their promise when they're building a business. And when I see founders agreements which are fully vested since they won, now I, I, I'm a little bit concerned because I saw many young entrepreneurs giving up, walking away with their equity. And that's unfair not for the investor, it's unfair for the other co-founders or employees. Which means I would strongly suggest to have some clear understanding of the long-term views and vesting programs since day one. I'd like to agree with that. Uh, yes, every marriage should start with a prenuptial agreement. Every <laughs> founder relationship, and, and even if there are no assets, you need to talk about the dissolution of a marriage before you go into it, just as you should talk about the dissolution of a partnership before you go into it. Much easier to have that conversation at the beginning, at the beginning rather than when it's emotional at the end. And that's just, that's just, that's just common sense. It's good, it's good to sit down and talk to your partners and say, how into this are you? And if it's not going well, are you going to want to bail or are you going to stay with it? There's another interesting question that I used to ask all the time when I'm thinking to invest in, in one specific entrepreneur, and, and is, which is your magic number? And the, the magic number is the exit number. Sometimes you, you talk to entrepreneurs and they tell you, well, this is going to be a billion dollar company. And that's totally fine, as an investor will be super happy. But you know that that specific niche uh, it's not that it's only 500 million. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's probably 10 million, right? Exactly. Uh, which means, how important is for you that vision about the exit from the entrepreneur? Is that, is that something that you, it's important for you? Is completely marginal? Do you ask that question? Uh, you know, I usually, I just go, 
it's a great question. I don't usually ask, you know, uh, um, you know, what's the exit strategy? Because that's mm -hmm. just doesn't feel right. I agree. And it's seven to ten years to exit, so that's certainly something you can have a plan, right? Mm -hmm. So what I try to do instead is just, you know, get a feel for what the product is and really look at the market generally and try to understand, you know, whether it's a sizable market. And I'll use, I'm going to use Sketchy, I'm sorry, Jordan, I have to use you as an example because you're here, but I, I looked at Sketchy, which I love. By the way, if you haven't downloaded it, you absolutely have to. This evening is the only thing I'll ask of you. Um, <laughs> because it's a wonderful app, and I fell in love with the user experience. It's really, really well done, and I love the engagement. This is not the way Jordan would describe it, I will, but I, I think it was a social network for creatives. Um, you can post a selfie and someone will do a portrait and there's just this great engagement around it. When I looked at that, uh, uh, I really, I stepped back and I thought about the creative class worldwide. Remember Richard Florida's book, he yeah. talked about the creative class. You know, that's 250 million people around the world. And I thought, you know, this is a social network for creatives. Uh, you know, will, will we ever have 250 million downloads? I don't know, but I can get my head around a size of a market. So it wasn't about the exit, it was just like, are there going to be enough people in the world that are actually going to care about this? So that's the kind of question that I typically ask myself. Well, the reason I didn't sit longer a second left is because um, I, I replaced the founder, and that's a really difficult thing to do. He hired me as his replacement. That's a really, really hard thing to do. And after two years of it, we figured out that it was probably not uh, the best way forward for, for, for me and the company. And uh, 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 I left. So, you know, sometimes you, you pick things that, that uh, are either not the greatest fit or uh, not the best opportunity for you or not the best use of your time. But I tend to stay with things a lot. That's my nature. I stay with things a long time, and I'm a patient investor. I mean, that's the other thing. When I invest in a company, I don't assume that I'm going to get the money back tomorrow. Actually, I don't assume that I'm going to get it back ever. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the right thing to do. Right? I, I assume that it's gone. I used to say that I write off every single check. Mentally. Uh, <laughs> I take a long uh, yeah, term you have approach. To. Uh, you have, have to. to, because if not, it's insane. Yeah. Uh, it's completely yeah. crazy to do what we do. I used to say that. We pay, we work, and we suffer with the entrepreneur, and we only have a couple of points, which means you gotta be really crazy. I think that many of us, we do this sort of thing because we were on the other side. And we have this vision that if you were lucky to have people thinking and, and, and helping and trusting you, you gotta do the same. And when you get older, uh, you, you start doing these sort of things. I did 30 investments, how, how many is your proponent? Uh, 23. Which means, the theory is you have to do more than 20 because if not, the risk is so high that as an asset class of investment, this is a suicide. Which means if you only do one or two, you know that you're going to be losing most of your money or all of your money. If you do 20 plus, uh, at least your portfolio, you're going to have a couple of wins. The, the reality in, in my own case is I do this, uh, but also I, I keep doing company building stuff because I'm an operator and I like to build things and I like to be active with things. I, uh, you seem to be a much more disciplined and professional investor. Uh, tell me about that. Because well, I don't know that I'm disciplined and professional, but uh, thank you for that. <laughs> that's, that's nice of you to say. Uh, I, I, I think I, I'm an analytical person and I love, I'm, I was a strategy consultant. So I like to conceive of the strategy and kind of dream. And um, and I'm a good operator, right? I've run companies before, but I, I find that I'm I enjoy the process of finding great investments, working with the entrepreneurs, and you know helping them in any way I can, you know, shape the future of the company more than I like. You know, I've been a CEO three times, so I like it more than rolling up my sleeves and actually doing all the work. I have to really like the person, and, and it's, it's, I believe it's a karmic world. I have to connect with the person, feel like they're a good person, decent person, ethical person. I, just, I, I, I love smart people. 
Um, and I also have to feel that they're scrappy and, and, and hard working and will do what it takes to be successful. I mean, within ethical boundaries, but we'll give it, you know, every ounce of energy and effort and mind share that they have. Those are the things that I look for. What really pisses you off from an entrepreneur? What are you really angry with an entrepreneur? Oh, let me count the ways. No. <laughs> um, I think <laughs> that there's an attribute that I don't like in anyone. And I see it in, you know, we read about it in the press all the time from some, some, some high flyers say, I loathe arrogance. I love confidence. I absolutely love arrogance. I think it's just a horrible character trait. So, you know, sometimes I've seen entrepreneurs who raise, get, raise a big funding round uh, at a massive valuation and they become absolutely holier than thou and untouchable. And, you know, that is absolutely yeah. a recipe for disaster yeah. because we know what happens with hubris, right? I mean, you fly too far uh, close to the sun and the wings melt. And so that's probably the thing that, that I get most upset about is when I see people, you know, cash a big check and all of a sudden, you know, they, they know everything there is to know. Humility is a beautiful thing. I like to see it in my own approach. What I like most is when there's traction. And I think today it costs almost nothing to, to you know, to build an app and start a company relatively. I mean, it used to cost $25 million to start a company and now it costs, you know, a tiny fraction of that. I like to see something out there. I like to see traction, and um, and and once I see some some user adoption, then I feel a lot more comfortable making an investment. That's my preferred place. I like, and it depends by business, but I like to see customers using it, positive feedback, great engagement. That's the ideal. Okay. Next question. I want to go back to the Miami sure. conversation. Um, your view is seed is. Easy. Oh, my God, here it's coming back. But I know that it's not easy for many of you guys. Uh, right. and, and I want to I wanna try to find some balance between how easy or difficult it is. Sure. Um, in comparison, you know, I, I invested in deals in Austin, The Valley, New York, and my own, and Latin America, and Europe. And my own views is that the good teams and ideas are going to validate the story in less than four to six months uh -huh. in Miami mm -hmm. if they have a reasonable valuation. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about that before. The big question is what is a reasonable valuation in this market? Because it's really changing fast and it's quite dramatic from the valley to the world. But based on your short Miami experience, but you have a broad also portfolio of investments in many different places. Local valuations are realistic, aggressive, or attractive? I think they're all over the board. Okay. I think I've seen them all over the board. I guess I would have one, and this, this sounds completely biased because I'm an investor, but I will say I've been an entrepreneur and I raised money at this, an extraordinary valuation uh, once before. And you can shoot yourself in the foot in New York Absolutely. because if you, if, 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 you know, uh, if you're greedy, and you raise an extraordinary valuation the first time, that means the hurdle that you have to achieve to get the next round of funding is through the roof. Yeah. So I think that a big mistake would be to go after an insane, and even get an insane um, initial valuation. That just means your Series A, which I already think is really hard, just got you know uh, exponentially harder. I couldn't have been more, and it's easy to say this when you're listening to this from investors, but again, as an entrepreneur, I always try to raise money at a very realistic valuation because I know that the next step, if, if that valuation is crazy, it's, it's, it's going to come back. It's, it's just a boomer. It is, absolutely. And I, we saw some examples here on you know, expensive seed valuations and, and down rounds. Uh, and a down round is a very very troubling thing. Yeah. It's very hard to recover from a down round. You do not want to find yourself in that situation. Now, we all agree that Series A is the big problem here and all over the place. 
any ideas, suggestions, or formulas for entrepreneurs in terms of validating the story and finding alternatives to Series A? We, we, we can talk about angel list, we can talk about syndication, and many new tools. What are, which are your views about that? Okay, I think those are all great tools. Yeah, um, do you guys know about angel list and those sort of tools? If not, we can clarify a little bit more. Please clarify Series A. I mean, yeah, AngelList basically it's 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 an online tool for angel investors, early stage investors, where you can syndicate with specific investments. And now many venture capitals are using that tool, and angel famous angels are also syndicating with that. In some places, that is replacing Series A because you can raise a couple of million plus using AngelList. Uh, Series A, I consider Series A something that is north of three million from. Sometimes it's less and then more. Yeah. But what do you think about these new uh, disruptive uh, funding tools? I think they're wonderful and I think you should use them um, as aggressively as you can. Um, I've slowed down in investing in companies from the Valley in New York because I felt like it was getting really frothy and expensive. And if I look at the last five investments I've made, um, I think all but one have been outside of New York and San Francisco. And a couple of those have been uh, companies that reached out directly to me. Um, one, uh, and, and I think one is one that I myself found on the angel list. So one thing most active investors do is they're always cruising around angel lists looking at the cool companies. Because I mean, so it's easy. It's easy and it's entertaining. So I would be there. And uh, listen, I, I made an investment in a company that I think is going to be an enormous success. It's called Cranify. Do you know where it's from? It's not from Miami. It's from Edmonton, Canada. How many of you know where Edmonton, Canada is? America. Okay. All right. I had to look on the map. All right. It's cold there. I've never been. I'm probably never going to go. But I was introduced to this entrepreneur. I fell in love with what he's doing. He's killing it. He's in Edmonton, Canada. He's, and I don't think there's an AGP there. No, so, I, I, I couldn't agree more. So if you hustle, yeah. if you hustle and you use Angelus, and you know what? I've made a couple of investments from cold emails via LinkedIn. I, I, so, I totally believe that. Again, hustle. We, we, we have to, to be very honest with ourselves and with Miami. And again, I, I'm not a local. Who's a local here? A local more than 30 years here. One guy from eight, two guys, which means we're all coming from someplace else. Some of us are coming from pretty difficult places, and this is not bad, which means uh, if you want to build a business here, I'm not saying that it's perfect, but you have a lot of evidence. Uh, you know, coming from where I'm coming from, we never dreamed to have a Knight Foundation or uh, Endeavor or uh, an angel group or stuff like that, and that's the reality, which means I want to go back to that idea. Uh, we were talking with Mark before. Many people think that being an entrepreneur is cool, is sexy, it's a lot of fun. I don't agree. I don't know what you think, but it's it's a lot of hard work. And uh, the reality is that it's going to be hard work here or in any place else. Uh, I, I want to pick your brain about that cool and sexy entrepreneur syndrome and, and which is your own views about the reality, the real day-to-day -day life of being a company. It's it's hard. It is the hardest thing here. Well, maybe having children is you know, kind of right up there. And it's equally it's expensive. It's equally as humbling. Um, it's 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 one of the hardest things you can do. I mean, you, you know, the, the one of the challenges is that we all see the same thing. We see Mark Zuckerberg, right? We see Facebook, which looks like it, which is grand, straight to the moon, and we think that's what it looks like. And the truth is, in my like twenty some odd companies, it is not a linear path up and to the right. It's filled with twists and gyrations and um, ups and downs and, you know, you know, everything that can go wrong goes wrong. It's really hard. And it's not for the faint of, it's not, it's not for the faint of heart. And please don't start a company if you think that you're going to, you know, build a WhatsApp and it's going to pop to a, you know, you know, a billion dollar valuation in uh, 18 nanoseconds. It just, that really, it doesn't happen. I, I, it does once a while. I, I also think that it's pretty lonely. It's a very short feeling. Uh, after that, the reality comes. And, and that's why I love participating in places like this. Because when you're here, you can talk with people that have the same feeling, that you don't feel alone. Here's the, there's a great, the lab is phenomenal. I mean, it's just a great community. And 
everyone shares your pain, and you should always find a buddy to talk to about it. Because I, you're absolutely not alone. I was talking with a new entrepreneur in town who's from Sao Paulo, who's building his new company here, and, and he was telling me that in, in two months he was able to meet amazing entrepreneurs, mentors, and, and different sort of vendors, and it's really helping him to move extremely fast. Um, and I think that that's happening here, and, and I encourage you to network to those specific groups. Again, you mentioned some of those groups, but you have Venture Hive, you have the Net Foundation, you have the Angel Group, you have the Lab, you have many conferences, you have Refresh, and since this is a very small town, we're all collaborating with each other, and that's, I think that that's a pretty nice asset if you know how to use that, that specific asset. Don't be shy about it either. Absolutely, I mean, absolutely. I invest in e-commerce and e-commerce enablement, social media and social media enablement. So I wouldn't be the right person for that. But I think every industry category that's dynamic, where there's a possibility for breakthrough and change, is going to have a set of investors that are interested in, you know, in disruption in that category. So I don't think, I think there, there are plenty of people who invest in things that, you know, you, you might not see on the, on, on the top of the tech branch. There's a market for it, and people who are excited about it, there's opportunity to build a significant business. Capitalism is highly efficient, but, you know. Uh, the, the, other thing, the other thing that I will encourage to any of you is uh, pitch the right investor on the right sweet spot. Because if not, you're going to be losing a lot of time and energy. Exactly. And same thing on the other side. Do your research. Do your research. The, the, the thing that we're trying to do with these angel groups, and we are collaborating with two or three angel groups, is we're trying to identify experts in each specific vertical. And if, let's assume that we have a pitch on, on social media, and Mark take a look on that. If he is excited with that, he's going to become the champion of that group, and everyone will believe that his judgment is strong enough for us to take a serious look. Which means sometimes the most sophisticated investors are paying us, but if they really understand what you're doing and they, they really support you, they, they will accelerate growth quite rapidly. That's right. Because, because <laughs> they, they really know the region, they have the network, they have uh, validation, and, and they're coming from that specific uh, opportunity. We were talking with Mark before about how difficult it's Latin America, and you know, um, I, I believe that we're going to see more uh, venture capitalists and private equity guys doing this in Latin America if they get success stories. And, and that's something we can, we, that's another value we can, you know, present because I, I was actually successful in Venezuela, meaning that uh, I could have been successful in Colombia and uh, probably in Mexico, mm -hmm. which is a huge market for ERPs. So, um, I, I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm making the right question here. But uh, uh, I don't think uh, there is apologize. a right answer. Uh, I don't think that there, is a, there is a clear or right answer. There is, uh, as we were talking before, there is not there is no secret recipe for success in these sort of deals. I think that is a case by case. I think that if you want to do something like America, you're in the right place in terms of validating the story of raising money. That's my view. Yeah. I think if you build something that's phenomenal, something people want, something customers use, and something that makes money, there's Yep. There's probably success to be had there. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah. yeah, my second question um, was uh, regarding embracing failure. Um, you, know, you talked a little bit about it, and you know, given that you're coming from sort of the creative side of things, you're probably seeing your share of failure. So I, I'm interested in finding out, like, how does the story look from the investor side or from the entrepreneur side? What are your expectations? Like, how, how should I just call you? Like, you know what? Like, the numbers aren't adding up. Um, see, it's sort of the uh, end of the road, and it's a quick drop off. And and I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm I want to sort of feel that out. I want to just like hear it from you as you've experienced it. You know, if you can throw some data and sort of see like what those. I had that call today. Yeah. I mean, is this like is, what are the numbers look like? I mean, okay. The, the the question is is embracing failure. So if you, you you know you have an entrepreneur. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I'm sorry. But you know you have an entrepreneur. The entrepreneur's uh, running out of money. The product's not where it needs to be. Um, experiencing some difficulty and calling the investor. You know how does that go? What does it look like? I've had many of those conversations. I mean it's it's probably more the rule honestly than the exception. Yeah. 
Uh, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, I think if you're talking to experienced investors, it's a movie they've seen many times, and you know, it's a conversation that you know you have to have because, as I said before, it's not a linear path straight up. It's mostly not. And uh, I think those are if you have a good investor set, you have, and and you're an open entrepreneur, uh, you know, you're more likely to have a, a good outcome. And I, I want to make one comment about failure. Um, you should work as hard as you can to make your company a success. You should put everything that you have into it. But you should also be prepared to fail. And you're going to have to feel okay about failure. Um, because the rest of the world is going to feel okay about it. I mean, um, uh, here's an example. I'm in a company called The Real Real. Um, it's a luxury consignment. We'll do over $100 million in revenue this year. It's run by a woman who's 57 years old, and she's killing it. I love her. I'm on her board. The company's a phenomenon. Do you know what her first company was? Pets.com. Google it if you don't know it. It's one of the biggest blow-ups in internet history. Did that stop me from writing a check to her? I was like, hell no. I mean, she learned a lot about failure. She's probably going to be really good the second time around. I can tell you, she's doing a great job the second time around. So most investors are not going to look at failure and say, oh, that entrepreneur tried and failed. I'm not touching it with a 10-foot pole. Instead, what they're going to say is, what did you learn? What are you going to do differently next time? And if you have a good answer for that, that's, you know, that's almost as good as money in the bank. I think that the bad part of failure is when the emperor is not honest with himself, his team, and the investors. I see many entrepreneurs that they're buying their own story, and that story is not true. And they're not honest enough to say, we're, we're failing, and this is not working. And you read the investor reports, and you know that it's not true. The team knows that it's not true, and, and the story is still there. That's the bad failure that we don't want to see. Because if we see the entrepreneur working up and losing every single dollar, but 100% committed, there's nothing wrong with that. Would you agree with that? or, or Because I, I, I could agree more. Uh, there are some entrepreneurs that I back. They, we lost every single dollar, and I back them again. Same here. And some entrepreneurs that we make a nice profit, and I will not back them again. 100% agree. I'm a contrarian in many cases. Okay, so when I invested in Twitter, um, uh, some very uh, uh, experienced people told me that it, it was a ridiculous investment. I didn't know what I was doing, and you know, if they, if, if it were a, a choice they were making, they probably wouldn't do it. So, and that was the best investment that I had made. Um, and it turns out, in a couple of cases, my best companies are companies that the rest of the world thought were bad ideas. Um, and so I, I think what I try to do is uh, disregard uh, common wisdom, and I try not to follow the crowd. Next question. Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, what I'm really looking at is whether somebody's, you know, deeply committed, uh, in love with the idea, has a great vision for the product and company, and is a is a good and decent human. I, I will learn something. I'm always scared about what I call lucky like sperm, which is very rich people from rich families that they want to be an entrepreneur because it's so cool. Uh, that's always not all, but sometimes it's a red flag to me because. They, I want to see at least a lot of respect for the investment. And again, I'm not coming. From, I'm on a board in, in Silicon Valley, and every single time that I come back from those board meetings, I'm always horrified about the way that we're treating fund rate and investment. And you know, you have to invest more. It was like the first bubble in many ways, where we only have to remember that. And I, I believe that entrepreneurs that they are frugal and they have a very deep commitment about the investment and the capital. Usually, at least in my own experience, they do a better job. Uh, but there's nothing wrong on, on investing in a super wealthy entrepreneur if he's able to show me that he's going to respect the capital deeply and be super committed with fund rate and expenses and discipline and KPIs. That's my own. There is one thing that I find troubling that comes after the investment, not before. 
And that's when, uh, you know, you see a lot of, you know, first class travel around the world and, you know, someone's riding in the back of Bentley and, you know, you're thinking, wow, that's maybe not so cool. So, uh, um, and I do think in, 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 this, in, in, in this period when we're in where people can raise massive amounts of money, uh, I, I, I always feel like it's a very dangerous strategy to build a super expensive corporate office because it's usually like you know failure comes after the you know after the corporate the corporate canvas. Right? One of the things I guess I'm surprised by is is, is why I don't see think more things that are related to tourism, mm -hmm. and that could just be my deal flow and the people that I've met. But I mean, this is like a you know mecca for tourism, and there are some really big um, you know big hospitality and uh, travel and entertainment companies here. I'm not seeing as many deals. Well, I, I talked to a, a company today. I was pitched by a company in New York that has created a, a new, yet another uh, interesting booking uh, uh, engine for hotels. The innovative model. I'm not going to invest. I'm surprised I'm not seeing stuff like that out of here. Yeah, we should see probably more hospitality yeah. tourism related, but they are some, uh, not as much as they probably should. Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, yeah, care.com is a phenomenal service. So so I think, um, I think, um, I just look at what's here. I look at, I see medical, yep. I see travel uh, um, and tourism. Um, uh, uh, I see the in real estate, I see the, you know, the elderly. Um, and uh, I, I would think that you'd see a lot of uh, interesting startups in, in those categories. Oh, there are also a lot of banks here, so the fintech is another area. Let's go to the Hi, Hello. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I, tourist wise, a friend of mine started a little company, dropped out of high school to start orbits. And I was inspired by trying to do some kind of Chinese, think of healthy Chinese from China to care about Miami because they're a big market. Right. But the question I want to ask um, fundamentally is what is the key disruption you think, uh, business wise, society, societally, our, our country needs right now? Do you think? The big the key disruption. I think that one of the, I think there's a, 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 there are two. One is education and one is healthcare. And I'm absolutely underwhelmed by everything that's happening in, in both. As a as an American, I'm appalled by the healthcare system, and I'm utterly appalled by the uh, educational system. So I think those are two societal disruptions that we need to really replace. Well, uh, yeah. You work with what Bill Cox. Any conclusions, any lessons learned from Bill Cox? I love that man. If he, if he, I think he's given TED Talks, he, he gives a lot of speeches. Take a moment if you ever have a chance and watch him. He's probably the most brilliant person I have ever worked with and for. And he is a kind, a kind spirit. But what I love most about him is he's an idea a minute. And if you go to lunch with him, he will pitch you on 50 ideas. And he'll have 10 while you're at lunch. I just sit there usually with my jaw on the table listening because he's, he's, he's just a brilliant man when it comes to generating ideas. He, and everything he looks at, he looks at every problem and he finds a creative solution in every environment and format. It could be valid parking the car, it could be you know parking on the street. Could be, you know, the, the the way the restaurant is 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 is, you know, acquiring food for the table. I mean, everything is a business opportunity for him. Genius. What's his last name again? Gross. G R O S S. Okay. There are two Bill Grosses. One's a big um, uh, money manager, and the other is a big entrepreneur. He's the big entrepreneur. Okay. Next question. Can I can I ask you a question about Second Life? Sure. How do you see that growing up now with the Oculus Rift? Well, it's a, a, a complete immersion yes. virtual. Well, I think it's a, I think it'd be a great marriage there. I right? Mean, right? Uh, here's yeah. The question, here's the, question. the question is, is uh, could Second Life have a second, I'm paraphrasing, could Second Life have a second life because of Oculus Rift? And I think there's a, a new, uh, renewed interest in virtual worlds. Um, you know, because of Oculus Rift and other things that we've seen, so I think it's a great opportunity for Second Life. Second Life 
is, is huge and, and amazing. And, and, and what content generation, I mean, the virtual world that needs uh, something to be believable, to be, once you emerge in uh -huh. it, it, it needs to be something that you believe because it, it's not the same relationship as you with a TV. With, well, we, we, you know it's 2D, so okay, it's fine. Okay, but so once you immerse, you you need yes. to have this real experience. So is there yes. a business? Okay, so here's the question. I, I haven't used the Oculus Rift because you know, I mean, I, I, was, I was immersed in Second Life for two years and uh, I haven't been really immersed since. I haven't put on the, the Oculus Rift. My first question to someone who put on the Oculus Rift was, how is the, the nausea? Because one of the things that happens when you get in these deeply immersive virtual worlds or virtual environments. It sucks. Well, no, and it's, it's hyper real, and you know, you can get motion sickness. And, and they said it was, uh, it was actually super real, but uh, they didn't get motion sickness. And that's really a, a Because it sucks. That was, that was my experience. I tried here the last week, and it was, it was okay. It was not perfect, but it was okay. Yeah. But it's not believable. That's what I'm saying. It needs to be believable. There was, there's, oh, there have been more books um, written than you can imagine, and more research papers done on Second Life. I mean, I had a stack on my desk that was really this high. And one of the things that uh, was studied to death is, is how deeply people can uh, immerse themselves into their personal avatar to the point where you know if, if their you know if their avatar is injured in second life they can almost feel the pain viscerally and i think that's really powerful i think oculus Rift brings a whole new set of opportunities you know? yes yeah my third question is uh, <laughs> you're well armed <laughs> um, i'm interested to find out uh no i'll just speak about that um, so I'm, I'm interested, you know, Second Life you know, being that that's the uh, topic that we're talking about right now. Um, when, when, I don't know if you were involved in raising money for Second Life? Uh, no, we, we made so much money we were raising money for our meeting. It's ridiculous. It's insanely profitable, yes. Alright, so then I'll go back on, on this idea of South Florida being, you know, active with uh, the investment community now. Um, I'm wondering what your take is on sort of investments that are involving these really big ideas, which I think Second Life sort of falls within that gamut. You know, a lot of like machine learning, you know, a lot of these big data displays aren't necessarily, you know, finding a place in you know, our ecosystem because, you know, it's so far ahead that, that it's hard for investors here to get their mind around it. Um, and I'm just wondering if. I don't think so. I think I think great things can happen anywhere. I really don't. You know, um, I don't think I don't think we're precluded from having world-changing ideas. I think they can happen in, in today's world, literally anywhere. But there is there, there are an enormous there are not an enormous number of mainline VC firms that develop a lot of outpost offices. That's not you know that's not the typical behavior. So I, I don't think what we'll see here is a, a bunch of mainline VC firms in the Valley and New York who open an outpost. I think you'll see, you know, some some scrappy funds that will do that, like Scout Ventures. I think um, I think we will see some some funds emerge here that have a greater focus on uh, Series A because there are a lot of conversations that are happening about that. So I think. Some of those funds will coalesce here, so there will be a place to go, at least as a starting point for Series A. But I still think that for the foreseeable future, companies are going to be going to other markets to raise and to get those big uh, Series A and Series B checks. I think it's just a reality. But as you mentioned, I mean, Open English proof that it can be done, and, and plenty of others have done the same. Yeah. Yeah, your cloud of English and, and, and many more. I, I see as a combination between syndicating some local money to validate a story and close around with probably New York VCs initially, and some Valley VCs are starting to understand the opportunity. But I, I, I'm more optimistic about East Coast VCs. Same time zone. And it's easier yeah, yeah, bigger bigger to meeting. Yeah, it's just easier. Yes. And believe me, they think about that because they're, they're concerned about leveraging their time. Yeah. yeah. Last question. <clears throat> I'm interested in uh, ethical capitalism like Whole Foods, uh, you know, doing socially concerned takeover on ethical companies 
to make them social security or using pension plans or using their university endowments, family offices. Uh, what do you think about that? Can you repeat the question because you're cut out a little? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my interest is, I think, I think what we need is ethical capitalism, what you see in Sweden or Norway, Denmark. Um, and the way to do that is social concern takeovers of unethical companies using pension plans, university endowments, and family offices. A company that may not be so ethical and underperforming financially, make it better performing financially, more ethical. So I wonder what you think about that concept. Well, it sounds, it sounds uh, wonderful. I mean, I, I don't know whether, you know, whether it happens in practice, but one thing I will tell you is that there's a lot more focus in business on those very topics now than, than, than I think there ever has been. Right, I mean, uh, you know, companies are now scored um, on, on some of those behaviors. I don't mean legal ethics, I mean, you know, social relations. So I think, you know, there's a lot more goodness than there was a decade ago. And there are some local investors which are board members at Ashoka, which I'm sure that you know Ashoka is a non-profit supporting social entrepreneurship. You have Endeavor here. You have many local uh, investors who really get the, the social plus profit component and are doing a great job on that. I, I see that as great, number one, and I see that growing uh, hopefully in the near future. Mm -hmm. I think that with that, final comments, final thoughts that you want to share with the audience? I would just say first, uh, thank you all. You've been very generous with your questions and your time this evening. Thank you for coming. Second, uh, most of you are entrepreneurs. Good luck with your businesses. Build something great. Pour your heart into it. And uh, all the luck in the world to you. Thank you. It was a great conversation. Thank you very much.